Norman, Ed Sheeran was in the office here in Brisbane today. He wasn't. Do you know who Ed Sheeran is? I kind of do. Yeah, he's got red hair and he plays guitar. He sings a bit. <laughs> is, that, is that the guy? Red hair, yes, uh, but walking on four legs. It was an alpaca and I saw it getting out of the lift on the on an upper level of the ABC building in Brisbane. So it was a shearing ad rather than a shearing ad. <laughs> yes. I get, itch, I get itchy at the thought of more hair, so that's fine. As I always say, uh, explaining a joke makes it even funnier. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm falling all over the floor. Okay, good <laughs> stuff. Anyway, yeah, going to um, ABC Brisbane downstairs, which is just really like solidifying my desire to uh, to move into local radio if if interviewing alpacas is what it's all about. Pinning a lapel mic on is a bit hard, though. That's true. That's true. Well, this one had a lot of fur to work with, but instead I have to talk to you. I'm sorry about that. This is Coronacast, uh, a show all about the coronavirus, sometimes other nasties as well, and I'm health reporter Tegan Taylor coming to you from Jagera and Turrbal land. And I'm the non more haired Dr Norman Swan, physician and journalist on Gadigal land. So, Norman, let's start with some news. And one news item is about a newly discovered monoclonal antibody. And we heard a lot about monoclonal antibodies early on because it was a way of helping prevent and treat COVID before we had antivirals. But they're still really important now. And it's been quite hard getting one that works against Omicron. Yeah, just to, just to correct you there, what we're talking about here in this particular piece of news is actually an antibody, a naturally occurring antibody. The holy grail here is, can you find an antibody that you could manufacture into a monoclonal antibody as a medicine that actually is does, doesn't matter what the variation has been in the virus, it still actually works? Because with Omicron, um, in particular, the monoclonal antibodies that have been used to treat people um, with severe COVID-2 infection um, have become less and less effective. Oh, it's sort of like the universal flu vaccine where they want to get something that could work against all strains. This is the same, but for an antibody. That's exactly right. So what they've had is that they've got this fascinating cohort where, and by the way, the Doherty Institute in Melbourne has been involved in this research, where there are people who've had SARS-CoV-2 infection and then been immunised with uh, an mRNA vaccine. So they've had SARS first, SARS-CoV-2 infection first, then when the vaccine came along, they got immunised. And there's been tantalising evidence from this cohort of people that for some reason, which is hard to explain, that the, the, having SARS first and the mRNA vaccine, they are more prone to produce broader spectrum antibodies, in other words, antibodies that affect more than one kind of variant or subvariant. And what they found is one person in this cohort, a 51-year-old, infected with SARS, then got immunised with the, I think it was the Pfizer vaccine, has, they found in this person's serum an antibody which actually seems to cover all known versions of the uh, COVID-19 virus and animal uh, and animal versions of the same family of viruses. So it looks as though they've hit upon uh, this. Now, whether or not that's true as the virus mutates, but at the moment it's very promising that this is a broad spectrum anti antibody that neutralizes various versions of, the, of this coronavirus and other coronaviruses, which is very exciting, which means that you could potentially make that into a monoclonal antibody, in other words, a synthetic antibody that you could use therapeutically. So as you say, this is a single sort of in, in, individual and it's been written up and published in the journal Science and we'll have to watch that one as it evolves. Yeah. In, the, in this case, the small sample doesn't matter. It's just that this person's obviously got some peculiar genetics or something else going on inside them and they've got this uh, wide spectrum um, antibody in their bodies and that could then be taken out and generalised as a medication perhaps. So continuing with our little news wrap, one of the things that we've wondered about a lot throughout the pandemic is if and when COVID ever becomes seasonal and what sort of pattern it has across the year. And you sort of think of respiratory viruses be, as being winter viruses, but at the moment in the Northern Hemisphere, in the UK and in the US, they're looking at a, a summer spike over there. Yeah, the, the cases are starting to spike. Hospitalizations are starting to go up again. It's just early days yet um, in the Northern Hemisphere. We in Australia are down at a trough. So we've been through a bit of a peak and we're down at a trough now where hospitalizations and deaths and case reports are going down. But that's the point at which it starts to go up again. So if it goes up in the Northern Hemisphere, it'll go up here. We're in winter, they're in summer. 
unfortunately, it's still not a seasonal virus. And we're also seeing a little bit of over the top of the curve for influenza and RSV here as well. Yes, we seem to have got over the peak of both of those um, um, outbreaks or seasonal outbreaks in Australia. Um, So both flu and RSV are going down, which is good news. So Norman, you and me have been uh, chanting, get your booster, get vaccinated since basically vaccines have been available in Australia. And I guess the question that um, some researchers recently answered is, how much benefit do I as an individual get from getting that vaccine or getting that booster? Yeah, what chances have I got of, of, of gaining the benefit? And one way of expressing that statistic is how many people need to be vaccinated, or in this case of this research, boosted, to benefit in terms of prevention of severe disease. And without going into the weeds in terms of how they did this research, the bottom line was that 200 people overall had to be, ve- had to be boosted, in other words, get their third shot, for one person to be saved from severe disease and death. The, uh, for, to a pres- to, in terms of an ED presentation, turning up at ED, but not in bad enough to end up in hospital, there was about 156, so it was a lower number. And then unsurprisingly, that number needed to boost went down. In other words, your benefits increased if you were older and had more conditions wrong with you. So it dropped to about 100 or even lower than 100 if you were over 65 and had other comorbidities. So that's so that's that's the number needed to treat. Now, it's a complicated number because it does depend on how much disease is around. And I'll give you an example of measles. Now, measles is a highly effective vaccine, but the number needed to vaccinate to prevent severe case or to prevent measles um, if you are in a high burden country with a lot of measles around, is only six kids need to be immunised for one person to benefit. Now, in Australia, where there's almost no measles at all, the number needed to vaccinate to prevent one case of measles is enormous because we haven't got much measles around. But should measles come, then, um, then, then those sorts of numbers start to be prevalent. So it's a highly effective vaccine. But again, it's a complicated number. So it's different to vaccine effectiveness, like a percentage. Well, it assumes a constant effectiveness, but the um, but you know we all respond in slightly different ways to the to the virus, and in some and sometimes the vaccine in our in our own bodies will generate different levels of antibodies, again, depending on our genetics and circumstances. So it's very environmentally specific. So at the moment, when there's still a lot of COVID around, that's the sort of number you're talking about, between 1 and 200, depending on your situation. When we get down to incredibly low levels of COVID, the number needed to boost will actually become higher, but it's still worth protecting yourself because you don't want to get it and the chances um, that it re-emerges. And equally, that's why we protect children against measles, polio, whooping cough and other diseases which are quite rare. Number needed to vaccinate, really high, but if it were to re-emerge and become a pandemic or an epidemic, I should say, the number needed to vaccinate starts to drop in exactly the same number of children because your risk is higher. So basically what you're saying is for every 200 booster shots that we're giving in Australia for COVID right now, we're preventing one case of severe disease. Correct. And how does that compare to other numbers needed to treat or vaccinate for for other things like drugs? Well, uh, if you take statins for cholesterol in somebody who's at high risk, remember, and that's that's also, you know, you're, you're starting to qualify the number. So if you're at really low list risk and you take a statin to lower your cholesterol, very large numbers have got to take uh, cholesterol-lowering drugs to benefit. But if you're at high risk, say that you've got a 50% chance of a heart attack in the next five to 10 years, then it's down at 11 or 12 people have to take a statin for one person's life to be saved or one heart attack to be prevented from taking a statin. And as I've said, with measles, that varies according to how much measles there is around in the community. How do you kind of balance this this balance sheet, though? Because there's a lot of things that go into it. But if we just look at cost... How much does one vaccine dose cost versus one ICU admission, putting aside like human suffering? Oh, I mean, I I haven't got the numbers at hand, but an ICU admission is thousands of dollars a day. 
Um, and you've got an opportunity cost, which is that if you're in, if you're taking up an ICU bed, which is preventable, somebody else is not having major surgery because the bed is blocked in the ICU and can't get in. And so somebody else is effective. So there's an enormous cost equation there. And, you know, and if you prevent a heart attack or stroke, you're not just preventing a death and somebody else, somebody continues to be a productive member of society. They may not be disabled from their stroke and more active and requiring less health care. So there are lots of costs bundled around these, which the people who approve um, these drugs for, well, first of all, well, for subsidy by the government, take those factors into account, that the cost benefit, which is why with statins in Australia, we only prescribe statins for people who are at high risk of heart disease. That's not just a, a slightly raised cholesterol. You've got to be at high risk of having a heart attack or stroke. Then you merit a cholesterol reducing drug. It's not just cholesterol that gets you it. So in short, booster dose, a good deal. Tick. It's a very good deal. And finally today, Norman, I've got another question from the audience for you. This one is from Claire, who's interested to know where we're at with prophylaxis for COVID infections, so stopping the disease from being able to take hold at all. She's seen a flurry of research investigating repurposing of, of existing medications to prevent against COVID. And it actually reminded me of something. We've spoken about this a bunch of times in the past, but particularly in uh, 2021, we talked about a drug heparin as being used as a, like a nasal spray to prevent against COVID. What, what's happening with that trial? Well, with that trial, they have just announced that they're proceeding with the trial. It's taken them a while to get it going. Um, to to use low-dose heparin dissolved and then it goes into the nose, which makes sense because that's how the virus gets into our body, through the nose and through the so-called nasopharynx and attaches itself. And if you could actually stop that at that point, you would um, reduce the chances of getting infected when you know there's, inf you know there's infection around. So they're doing a trial of that because heparin turns out to have an antiviral effect superficially on the what's called the nasal and nasopharyngeal mucosa. So it'll be really exciting to see if that happens. Hang on. What is heparin? Like, what is it actually? What's it for originally? Heparin um, is a, a commonly used anticoagulant. So if you've had an operation, say you've had a hip replacement, they'll often put you on a version of heparin to prevent your blood clotting and you getting a pulmonary embolus. Um, so it's injected into, it can either go in your drip or it can get injected under the skin of your abdomen. So it's a commonly used anticoagulant. Uh, so in other words, stops blood clotting and still used for that purpose. In, in this case, it's actually another effect of heparin, which is an antiviral effect. And when we spoke to Don Campbell a couple of years ago about this paradox about using this, it turned out that it doesn't have, it's at such a low dose, it doesn't have an anticoagulant effect when you shove it up your schnoz. And of course, Don Campbell is the professor who has, is looking into the heparin study. And Claire's also asking Norman about other over-the-counter products and whether they're any good for preventing COVID infection. There isn't really any high quality evidence on that. And the Therapeutic Goods Administration in Australia has put out a warning just to people just to not rely on those over-the-counter products because the evidence just isn't in there yet. For most of them, they're pretty harmless and won't do you any harm, but they will do you harm if you think that they are protecting you and you become reckless about COVID. Right, of course. Oh, well, we'll have to leave it there. Don't be reckless and we'll see you next Wednesday. We're never reckless. Bye. <laughs> Subscribe to listen to more free podcasts or download the ABC Listen app and stream ad-free.